Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much indeed uh, for joining us. Normally, this would be the Greater Manchester weekly briefing, but today I'm joined by the Mayor of the Liverpool City Region, uh, Steve Rotherham, because we felt we'd hit a moment here in the crisis where uh, we needed to come together again and uh, deliver some clear messages uh, to, to the government. So we're here today to do that together in a spirit of still wanting to work in partnership uh, with the government. What I'll do is I'll take you through uh, the Greater Manchester slides that you'll be familiar with. Then Steve will uh, come in and take you through uh, the Liverpool position uh, and say some further comments. Then I will conclude uh, with a few of my own before we get into your questions. So if I could ask my team to put um, uh, the first uh, slide up for you. So these are figures, of course, that you'll be uh, familiar with. Uh, extremely uh, challenging picture. Uh, and it, it certainly remains that that way. Some um, signs of progress, certainly in, in Bolton. Um, you can see there a, a slight uh, flattening. But of course, in the last week, we've seen um, uh, pressure uh, in, in other places. Um, of course, uh, the outbreak in, uh, in Manchester, at the uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, which will be um, partially picked up in these figures, but not uh, not not fully. So you can see the picture uh, there across uh, across the boroughs and across Greater Manchester. There is a a general uh, rise uh, to 165 cases per 100,000 population. So if we could just go on to the second slide. Um, this is obviously uh, the slide that we've begun to show you on testing. Uh, you will see that in the in the last week that ended on the 26th. Um, the highest level of testing that we've recorded so far. Um, so 2,425 uh, tests per 100,000 population. Uh, and I think it's it's fair here to say to the government that that is an encouraging uh, uh, development. It's certainly improved uh, in the last uh, week uh, and uh, we're glad uh, to see that. Obviously, the positivity rate uh, along the bottom is something that um, is is much higher than we would want it uh, to be. It varies, of course, across the 10 uh, boroughs from uh, 5.3 in Stockport uh, up to 14.2 um, in Manchester. But I think that, of course, is explained by what I, by what I said a moment uh, ago. But still a high positivity rate averaging at 8.9, which is uh, not what we would want to see and it would need to come down. On to the next slide. Um, it's a it's a slide that you will get used to now because we are very focused on this. Uh, I'll come back to this in my um, my, my closing remarks uh, just to show to you that the uh, weaknesses in the national uh, test and trace system are uh, persistent and are, are not going away. Uh, so um, no real change on, on the week in terms of the numbers of people who are uh, contacts of positive cases. Uh, but who are not being reached and that that number is nowhere near acceptable to us going into the winter. Uh, if I may then have the final slide. So this is an important slide. Let me just dwell on this slide a, a little longer. Of course, um, we are watching closely the effect on our hospital system of the increased community uh, transmission. Uh, and what you can see here is a change in the week between the 22nd of September and the 29th um, with a, a significant increase in the number of cases. I have to say though, albeit low compared to what we were dealing with uh, back in uh, the height of the first wave, but nevertheless uh, increase in hospital admissions over the last week uh, of um, 13 uh, cases uh, on the week in terms of the cumulative figure. And we're beginning to see as, as the cases have remained at a more high level uh, throughout September, uh, the number of patients in, in hospitals beginning to increase. So a significant increase in the numbers in, in intensive care this week uh, and similarly in non-intensive care beds, you know, both showing a, a, a rise. Uh, more encouragingly, uh, the position in care homes um, has improved a little uh, over the week uh, and of course remains very low overall. Any infection is uh, something uh, to be regretted, but nevertheless 
uh, low uh, level of, of um, infection within our care homes. And of course, we remain uh, extremely vigilant about that. So that is your uh, Greater Manchester overview. I will now hand over to the Mayor of the Liverpool City Region, Steve Rotherham. Steve. Thanks, Andy, and thanks for the invite again. I think we've done about four or five of these now. And at every stage, I have to say, we've been ahead of the government thinking and the government have responded to those requests. And hopefully from today, once again, the government will listen to what we have to say because it's so important to our areas. And, you know, in our areas, we're talking about 4.2 million people. And I don't think they can um, be ignored much longer. Um, OK, so if we put the, the slides up, um, slide one, um, it should show the seven day testing figures per 100,000. And you can see that our levels are equivalent and in some cases higher than Greater Manchester. But the most important thing to look at is the rate of increase. And what we've seen is exponential growth over the last three weeks. And we expect this to be fair. They don't forget all of these figures that we're both showing have a lag and that lag um, even in a few days, you could sort of see how much the actual real time position might be, and it's quite worrying for us all. Slide two is um, the pillar one data, which is hospital testing. And again, um, figures for us going in the wrong direction. Um, slide three is the pillar two stuff, which is obviously community testing. And again, there's some um, particular worrying um, sub sector stuff below that that we're, we're looking at. Um, thankfully, one of the things that we did win was the ability for us to get uh, the information, the data from central government uh, and we're using that now to, to try and tease out where trends are, for instance. And then on the final slide for me, which is slide four, um, this is the testing data on the number of contacts that aren't being reached by the national trace uh, test and trace system. And you'll see it's nearly 40% that aren't being contacted. So whilst we have in the Northwest about 40% of all new contacts, we've only got about 15% of the testing capacity. And therefore, if the government really are serious about it, rest than the massive increases in the exponential uh, number of new cases that we're seeing in our area, then we need to increase our ability to test people. Uh, and so we'll, that's one of the calls for me to government today. Um, work with us, but look to see whether we can get additional capacity, perhaps by using our universities more. Um, and for me, all of this really shows the alarm and, and serious level of cases in the Liverpool City region. Uh, and the only way that we, we are going to be able to tackle this is by working in collaboration with central government. So at the moment, um, we have a meeting with the six leaders of our districts uh, directly after this uh, event, where we'll be examining all of the options available to us and looking at what the potential scenarios might be in, in different um, restrictive um, um, menus that government might provide to us. But what we also need is a requisite support package for our businesses. In our area, we disproportionately um, have uh, the, the likes of the, um, the visitor economy, and that's worth about five billion pounds to the Liverpool City region a year and about 50,000 jobs are reliant on that. So if that is to be targeted by government, then we will need to have some compensatory package because otherwise there won't, won't be much of a, a visitor economy to call a visitor economy when we return in a post pandemic world to some sort of normality. And then um, just finally, I'm sure that people will be interested in you know, what we believe that we can do locally um, to address this. Uh, and my plea has to be around the messaging 
and I'd say to the government, wait with this to see whether there's a way in which we can tailor things so that will break through for certain groups. If you segment some of the the intelligence that we have, um, you can see that there are certain groups that have a higher propensity for the transmission of coronavirus. Work with us and try and see whether we can get those messages much more clearly um, articulated so that those people aren't listening to either a metro mayor or a prime minister, um, but listening to somebody that they may well um, believe has um, a better understanding of what their particular demographic might be, for instance. So that that's um, uh, it's a support package. It's also working with us. It's working in collaboration. It's looking at the scientific, the medical and the economic um, evidence to see what's best, whether we can determine what we need more locally rather than national government just simply imposing it. And just on one, one last thing, we need a clear roadmap for coming out of whatever restrictions are imposed because we've seen across the country that there have been a number of areas that have had the imposition of restrictions and is only looting that came out of those restrictions, as Keir Starmer said in the House of Commons today. So we want to see what the exit strategy for any restrictions might be. Um, with that, thanks, Andy, and I'll hand over to your team. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Steve. So just to, to pick up um, some of what you were saying there, um, the message for us from us today is we very much still want to work with the government, as I said at the start. I was pleased to be able to speak uh, to the Prime Minister last week. I did say to him uh, that we're here to help. Um, I recognise that none of this is easy uh, for the government and you know we don't envy the position that they're in, but I, th I think there are things that they could do which would be helpful to them as well as us in terms of sharing the burden, working together more in partnership, uh, central government with local government, which quite honestly isn't happening at the moment. And I think this is, explains why we've hit quite a, a dangerous moment in my view, in terms of where we're up to with this crisis. But just to show that there's evidence behind me saying we want to work with you and we're ready to do our bit to help. I'm pleased to say that yesterday, um, our pilot uh, on improving contact tracing using the support of Greater Manchester Police and Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service uh, went live. It's a small pilot at this stage, but it is focused on reaching those uncontacted contacts. And I hope that's uh, a kind of sign of our intent and our goodwill to work with the government uh, to fix these things. Um, but, and there is a very big but I'm afraid coming here, it's October uh, tomorrow. We're now looking at uh, probably the most difficult winter we've ever known in this country. It's staring us in the face and we are not where we need to be. I would say we're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of our readiness to face that winter. Let me just give you a few examples. As we both said today, we don't have a uh, test and trace system that is, is functioning properly. Uh, to protect the communities of Greater Manchester and the Liverpool City region. That's well documented. You know our arguments about that, but it remains the case that it isn't working. And here we are, we're weeks from the from the winter. Secondly, we're in a position here where we have had restrictions in Greater Manchester for nine weeks now, and there isn't any additional support coming to our um, businesses in most of our boroughs who have been affected by those uh, by those restrictions. But in the case of Bolton, you know, a really small amount of support, but a massive impact on businesses that are shut. And I say again, how, how they can justify that closing people's businesses, but not compensating those businesses or helping the individuals who work within those businesses, that I, I find is uh, utterly wrong and in yet it's still uh, the case and I want to say to those businesses in Bolton you're not forgotten from my point of view and I'll keep speaking up for you but it's a, a poor state of affairs that you're in this uh, position so we don't have kind of help to recognize the impact of the restrictions on our uh, on our 10 boroughs but then more broadly as I said last week 
the Chancellor's winter package doesn't go anywhere near what we need to, to, to protect the wider economy as we go into this winter. So we are now looking straight at the end of furlough as we've known it this year without a package of support for aviation. Greater Manchester is a huge, Greater Manchester has a huge number of people employed at Manchester Airport and many thousands on furlough and then all of the associated industries that come with Manchester Airport, no support package there, no um, support package uh, for people involved in, in live events, um, live music, nighttime economy, uh, all of those things that both of our city regions really rely upon. So what is going to happen across the Northwest this winter in terms of redundancies? I think we would both fear that they're going to be very high. And then if I then come on to the last point that Steve touched on, we've still got understandable public confusion about the messaging. So as I explained earlier this week, and I think came out yesterday when the Prime Minister spoke, there's kind of a, a lack of clarity between national messages like the rule of six and how they apply in areas where there are local restrictions. And if politicians can't explain that to people, then the public really have got no chance of, of working their way through uh, all of that. So there's confusion, but there's also potential contradiction between national policies and local restrictions. And I just want to come to this point again of the curfew that's been imposed on uh, hospitality with minimal, I would say even zero consultation with people at a local a local level and, and, and police forces. And, and I just want to sort of pull up a, a chart. There's not a huge amount of evidence available in this space about the extent to which um, infections are transmitted within the hospitality establishments within the hospitality sector. But this shows you um, in a proportionate way uh, the number of uh, number of uh, cases identified by Public Health England. And as you will see, it, it is it is small. And of course, these are places outside of the home. So the home accounts for a much bigger number than all of uh, all, all of these um, uh, cases. And so the effect of the curfew, in my view, is creating more gatherings in the home which are prohibited by the local restrictions. So it feels to me you have a clash again between a national policy and a local policy. And unsurprisingly, people are saying this, this doesn't make sense. And you know, certainly with the position that our hospitality businesses are in in both city regions, you know, they are, I think, feeling incredibly despondent uh, at the moment as we are heading further into uh, this difficult winter. So what does this all mean and, and, and where do we uh, where do we go from here? Well, I would say to the government in, again, in a spirit of wanting to work with them, that we can't carry on as we are. We are looking here at a winter that is going to do serious harm to the health of our communities and serious harm to the economy across Greater Manchester and Liverpool City region if things stay like this. So we, we, we cannot carry on uh, in this uh, in this way. We are ready to work with the government, but we need a reset here. We need a different way of working. We can't just have our ad hoc conversations here and there with ministers. We need to be involved. Don't do to us, work with us. Uh, and I'm afraid that hasn't happened uh, so far. The whole approach has been too centralised, too driven from rooms within Whitehall without any recognition of what some of this means on the ground and the way in which it affects uh, our communities. And my call today, I, I, I'm saying this supported by Steve, is we need to see, if it's not COBRA, we need to see a forum for joint decision making where policies can be put forward, discussed, and we can give feedback and, and then uh, we can proceed together and actually a forum like that will mean that we can debate things more in a constructive way without having to resort, I have to say to, the, to you all, to the media, but sometimes we're having to do that because it's sometimes the only way we can we can make our, ourselves heard. And what I, I, I would say within that forum uh, for joint decision making between national government and uh, people working at a regional and local level, I think we need uh, to agree a number of principles about how we go forward from here. I would say those would be three 
key ones from my point of view. No changes to policy, national or local policy in terms of restrictions, no changes to policy without proper consultation. That, that has got to be a given. Number two, I would say no restrictions. If we're going to have a tier system that has level two restrictions and level three restrictions, I would say a core principle should be no local restrictions without proper financial support for the individuals, businesses and councils in those areas who will have to deal with the consequences of those local uh, restrictions. And number three, third principle, no extra ro local role for, uh, for public bodies without proper resource. So if they are to help uh, the government with, with contact tracing, it must come with proper resource uh, to, um, to be able to put those, uh, those support uh, mechanisms in, into effect. So I think it feels to me like a week where we've got to kind of make a call for, for some change. Things feel unsustainable this week. And it also kind of feels like the last significant moment to make change before the winter. We ask the Prime Minister to listen to what we are saying. We ask him to address what we're saying uh, in what he has got to say to the nation later on. We, we say to him, rebuild some national unity, work with us. We are ready to do that. We are ready uh, to help. We realise how difficult this is for you and for the government. But, but let us carry more of the burden with you, involve us more. And I think we will be better placed to um, to rise to the challenge that lies ahead of us as a country. Thank you, Ross. I will hand over to you and we'll go through people's questions. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got a lot uh, of questions through, so thanks very much for sending them all through. Um, just given, we'll try to get to every question, but we'll definitely make sure we get one from everybody at the very least. Um, I'll start with uh, Niall uh, from the MEN. It's for you, Andy. Uh, the, the legality of the student lockdown at two Manchester Met University halls of residence last week has come into question after students claimed they were met by security and police when trying to leave. Do you think the initial approach to the situation was unlawful in any way and could it have been handled better? Could argue that the situation is now under control and the other universities and GM have got a handle on this? Uh, and a, a similar question from Nigel Barlow. Do you feel it was right, uh, the right thing to do for our universities to bring back thousands of students from all over the country into an area that was already struggling to keep the virus under control? That's Nigel at 159. So thank you. Thank you both. Um, I mean, the first thing to say, of course, it was a difficult situation um, that uh, presented itself uh, last last week and it, um, it needed a firm response. I think there's just no getting away from that. Otherwise, it could have turned into a much more serious incident that would have had an impact in the wider in the wider community. Now, I, you know, obviously there needs to be a, a bit of a look back at this, and I know that is taking place, actually. Um, both the university, Manchester City Council, everybody, Greater Manchester Police, everyone taking a look back. I was assured by the police actually that they weren't involved in stopping people leaving, although I'm aware that you know different things were, are being said and it all it all needs to be um, to be uh, looked into. As I, as I kind of indicated, there will always be things that we can look back on and say, well, maybe that could have been uh, done better. Maybe the messaging and the communications with students um, could have been um, better handled in the in the first instance when um, when things were starting to, to to escalate, and I think we should absolutely look at that. But in terms of you know the wider legality, of course, it is now law for people to to self isolate, and you know I think you know that that is something that couldn't be uh, couldn't be ignored. Of course, this this happened just before that came into law on Monday. But it was happening over over that uh, that period. So you know, my my um, heart goes out in many ways to the students who, you know, uh, are probably having a pretty miserable uh, time uh, right now. I, I do think nationally something should be done by the government to recompense students who are not getting the full benefit for their nine thousand pounds. They are not getting the full university e experience. But Nigel, to answer your question, I actually feel it is important that. We don't allow the lives of this generation to be completely derailed by this pandemic. It is right, in my view, that uh, universities have brought people back. Um, that does matter to the economies of cities like uh, Manchester and Liverpool. I think we've got to sort of work with the universities to, to work through these initial uh, challenges. Hopefully things will settle. 
and then we can we can progress into the academic uh, year. So uh, that's what I would say. It's a challenging situation for everybody, no doubt. And I don't think anybody acted in particular bad faith simply about protecting uh, public health. And um, obviously that's everyone's top priority now. But certainly uh, we'll be looking back, working with uh, our partners and I'm sure you know the learning will be will be shared around the uh, the city region. Thanks, Andy. Um, a number of questions uh, for Steve. I'm going to start with uh, Jess Forbes uh, from Global at 157. Uh, it's under the name Anonymous. Uh, for Steve, uh, with Liverpool on the brink of the first coronavirus circuit breaker lockdown on Friday, do you think this two week lockdown is the best thing to do to bring infection rates down? Uh, Liam Thorpe. At 2 p.m. from the Liverpool Echo, asked while Mayor Joe Anderson has called for a circuit breaker full shutdown, it seems more likely that Merseyside will see a ban on any household mixing in indoor areas. Uh, will this go far enough to arrest the rapid growth of cases in the region, or is something more substantial needed? And just below that, a quick question from Steph Oliver at Sky News: Do you expect we will get an announcement today about a Liverpool lockdown? OK, so we've got this meeting um, straight after this, this event, uh, which is the six leaders of each of the districts in the Liverpool City region, where we can go through some of the evidence that's been provided for us to look at what the potential might be for further restrictions. But I, I, I don't know where the circuit breaker has come from. It's, um, we had a, a meeting with Chris Whitty on Monday, uh, and it wasn't one of the options that was put to us. Now, of course, just like Andy, he's got 10 leaders and I've got six leaders. Leaders are entitled to their own opinions on what they believe might be the best solution to the problems that we, we face. But as the Metro Mayor trying to pull together a coordinated response that everyone can cohere around, we haven't come up with um, what our agreed proposals might be to work in consultation with governments to look at those particular restrictions for our areas. So um, whether individual councils are going to go off and do their own thing, I, I think is probably doubtful. We potentially will have a, an announcement from central government soon. Um, it, they haven't said what that announcement might be. One of the things that Chris Whitty spoke about was turning guidance into regulation. And that, of course, would be um, things like uh, inter-household mingling, because at the moment it's it's guidance. So that, that could be one of the, the things that governments do announce. But I hope there aren't pronouncements from central governments and that they will give us some space to work with them to come up with the, the best options of that a la carte menu that suit the, um, the issues around our particular um, exponential increases that we've seen across the patch. And that means that we do need to investigate and interrogate the scientific evidence, the, the stuff around the economic support that will be necessary, you know, the medical stuff around um, the transmission rates and how that then is manifesting itself into hospital admissions. And unfortunately, if this continues, we will see increasing death rates. So we need to um, first of all discuss all of that before um, we start to uh, make uh, judgments and, and come out and make statements about what's in the best interest of one of our areas. Thanks very much Steve. I'm going to go to a question on a slightly different topic from James Murray of the Daily Express for Andy. Uh, do you feel there's too much rent only property going up in Manchester and not enough property which can be bought by families? Is there too much development or too little? Well, we um, uh, need to see um, uh, development, uh, James, if we're to address the housing crisis. So it's not a case of too much or too little. Uh, well, it is a, it's a case of we do need uh, uh, development, so um, it's certainly not too much. I think what we need to see more of though, to answer your question, is houses that are truly affordable on a Greater Manchester definition of affordability, not a, a national definition that's skewed by London, would be one thing that I would say, uh, and actually more homes for social rent uh, built across the city region. So you know, we've recognised that there hasn't been enough uh, focus on that, and the Mayor uh, of Sol Salford, the city mayor, Paul Dennett, has set a target of 50,000 
truly affordable homes for social rent um, and um, according to the market definition um, by uh, the next decade. So on Monday you will see that we will publish um, the next version of the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework and this will be very much the enabling framework to bring in um, the brownfield sites that will deliver on that 50,000 uh, ambition. So to answer your question, I think we want to see more uh, truly affordable homes being built to buy, but also to rent in, in Greater Manchester to address our housing crisis. And I would say to, to the government, this is the perfect moment to do that. Coming out of this crisis, we should be building zero, a new generation of, of council homes that are zero carbon, age friendly, uh, we are ready to do that in Greater Manchester. We've got the plans to do it. We just need the, the support to do it. Thank you. A question uh, for both mayors from Michael at Heart and Smooth Radio. We're now in a situation where we're being asked to report our neighbours, potentially landing them with fines that could bankrupt them for breaking COVID restrictions. Are you comfortable with where, with where that puts us as a society? And if you want to take that one first, then we can go to Steve. I think, I suppose all of us are not feeling comfortable with where COVID has Put us overall you know it's 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 pushing us into all kinds of um difficult situations and i, I think people just need to use their judgment i don't think anyone's saying to people spy on your neighbors and you know check out what they're what they're doing i i think what what it's about is people using their judgment if there's something that is a you know a gathering that is going to put at risk um public health in a local community will you know i think people need to, to to be kind of judicious about that is that something that, that needs police involvement well you know then then they should they should uh, should do that but i don't think it's a case of you know turning neighbor against neighbor i, I don't think that's um what what's happening at the moment we just are in a really difficult position for all of the reasons i gave at the beginning and i think the danger is we must we must not get into uh, well two things actually one where we see politicians blaming the public I, I see this narrative growing all of the time at the moment uh, and honestly i think it needs to stop the idea that people in the north are more likely to break rules than in the south absolutely rub you know, complete rubbish uh, the, the reason why uh, the virus has spread more here is linked to the nature of people's work uh, the nature of people's housing, the failure to level up our communities by all governments over many decades. That is the reason why we are in a difficult uh, position. So don't blame the public, uh, I'd say that to all politicians. But then sec secondly, I'd say to people, let's not get in the position of, of blaming each other. You know, that isn't going get to us, get us through this. So, um, you know, I think it is challenging on every, every level at the moment, but I, I believe in the good instincts of the vast majority of the British public who will use their use their common sense in judgment when it comes to these things. Thanks Steve, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, only to add to I agree with Andy, but it, look, it needs to be a two way process, doesn't it? We expect people to act responsibly and if people don't act responsibly, then of course, like in every instance of somebody who breaks the law, there has to be action taken against that, that individual or those people. And so if, for instance, people are doing things that could um, put other people into danger of spreading coronavirus, then I'm sorry, um, I, I have to err on the side of caution. And our main concern always has to be public safety. And it's the safety of the, the 1.6 million people that I represent and, uh, and you know, the 2.6 that Andy does. They are um, our main concern and everything that we're trying to do, both working with government and, you know, speaking to um, the media is to try and get people to better understand that we all have a part to play in this, everybody. And if everybody does act responsibly, we will start to see the decline in the COVID transmission rates that we saw, you know, after the uh, initial three months of the lockdown. And we don't want to go through, surely, a full lockdown. So if people act responsibly, then I think we'll start to really see uh, the benefits of that. 
Thanks, Steve. Uh, two questions from uh, Nazi at The Guardian. Uh, initially, Frandi, uh, last week you talked about how nowhere south of Solihull is subject to local restrictions. Do you feel that some northern areas have now been living under restrictions for months, uh, who have been living under restrictions for months, now have been forgotten about? And for both Andy and Steve, um, would you be able to comment on what is now a very marked north-south split? Is that a real problem for the economy of Northern Powerhouse slash Redwall constituencies that the government is supposed to care a great deal about? So, well, yes, um, Nazia, in answer to your first question, um, as I say, I think Bolton has been forgotten about by national politicians, uh, and it's not for the want of making the case. I've done that on this press briefing. The leader of Bolton Council has, has, has done that. You know, there are many places today that have a higher a case rate than Bolton, but their hospitality remains open. And it's this lack of consistency that I think is making people lose faith in what's going on. The sense of injustice, I think, in Bolton is very, very real uh, today. So I, I would say it's simple. Um, either the government closes hospitality in areas with higher case rates, with full compensation, by the way, um, which obviously hasn't happened in the case of Bolton, but if there's to be any closure, compensation. And if they're not prepared to do that, they should let Bolton's open. I mean, it's got to be one or the other. You know, you can't have this sort of situation where you introduce restrictions and almost you forget about places and you, your attention wanders off somewhere else. Uh, but that's what I, that's what it feels like uh, has happened uh, here. And just to, for uh, Steve, um, Steve comes in. Yeah, I, this is a, it, as things stand, we're going to see the north-south divide massively increase and widen here. You know, if we go into a winter with the north under local restrictions, millions of people under restrictions, businesses suffering because of those restrictions, no support for those uh, businesses, you know, we're going to see um, a widening of the north-south divide. And uh, if we look back, you know, at it in years to come, you'll think that COVID-19 did more harm to the north of England than, than Margaret Thatcher and whatever she did in the 1980s. This is a real danger that is kind of staring us right in the face. And, you know, a government that says it wants to level up cannot put the north of England under restrictions without support. It's pretty much as simple as that. Thanks, Andy. Steve, do you want to come in on that one? If I can be political just for a second, we try not to be part of political, but when you get questions like that, they literally do um, lend themselves to a political response. And, and that is that I'm not sure that the governments ever really did care about red wall constituencies. What they did try to do is to ensure that they could borrow the votes. Uh, and I don't think those votes um, will be as easily uh, borrowed in the future as perhaps they were in December last year. Uh, and that's because whilst the rhetoric from government is something that I, I listen to and I think, oh, perhaps they are moving in the right direction. The reality is often the opposite of that. And when we talk about levelling up, that's exactly what myself and Andy Burnham and others really mean. We talk about levelling up and the government, I think, are talking about levelling down. And if that's what um, their idea is about trying to um, equal the economy across the north and south, then it's a danger for both of us. But certainly that growth in the north-south divide, that widening gap, doesn't seem to have shrunk, um, even with all of these sort of policy announcements from central government. Thanks, Steve. Um, a question uh, from Adam at the Jewish Telegraph for you, Andy. Um, we've been reporting almost every week of incidents of lockdown rules being broken in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community of Manchester. What is being done to tackle the lack of knowledge and understanding of these rules within these communities, as uh, Adam at 204? Well, thank you. Thank you, Adam. And I think it's, it's all communities, isn't it? But you're right, we have heard reports uh, too within the ultra-Orthodox community of rules being broken. But this is an issue for, for everyone to address. What I can say is that there is targeted work going on with all communities to uh, obviously explain the rules. Uh, as I say, they're not clear. Uh, and I think Steve has made the same point. Um, and we obviously want to then promote people's buy-in to, to observing those rules. It's all about protecting the health of all uh, communities. But 
you know, th there is a lot of work uh, underway uh, by Greater Manchester Police to obviously work with community leaders, and we're really grateful actually for the for the support that we've uh, that we've had. Um, we realise it's difficult for everybody where uh, restrictions are clashing with um, important, um, obviously holiday periods, festivals, um, important days within different communities, uh, and this is going to be really tricky for everybody going forward. But um, you know, we, we are aware uh, that there have been some issues, but we are grateful for the support of local leaders uh, who are working with Greater Manchester Police. Thanks, Steve. Steve did you want to come in on that one at all? It's not something that I, I'm aware of, to tell you the truth. I, I just uh, reiterate the point. Look, everybody is going to have to face some difficult times, and that will curtail some of those freedoms that we expected. Um, you know, would be there forever. I, and I've got neighbours um, who haven't been able to go to, to church like, as they want to because of the restrictions there. There are people that I've spoken to come uh, to see me in the uh, in Man Island in my office who um, can't go to their local mosque and all of those sorts of things are obvious um, during this difficult period for us all. But I, I just say that you know the, the laws apply to everybody and we all need to to play our part otherwise we're never ever going to get out of this bit really difficult upward trend that we're currently seeing thanks steve uh, a question uh, for andy but uh, steve i think you might want to come in on it as well from kevin fitzpatrick at radio manchester uh, andy you keep talking about financial support for areas affected by restrictions what specific funding is required in your view so for example business grants for low extensions and what kind of amounts are you talking about well kevin i want to take you back to a joint press briefing steve and i did back in the middle of the summer when the R number went above one here for the first time, and you'll remember that, we both made a call that day for local furlough. And I will repeat it today. If you're one of those people in Bolton who all of a sudden had no uh, job to go to because the pub, restaurant had been shut where you work, what, what are we doing for them? You know, you can't just say to them all of a sudden, You've got nothing or you, you you're on benefits you've got to give them in my view access to a local uh, furlough scheme it's the only right and proper thing uh, to do but then beyond that yes business grants proper compensation for loss of earnings uh not 500 pounds a week which doesn't touch the sides when it comes to to most businesses it's not enough to help them survive and if you listen to sasha lord our nighttime economy advisor but actually any voices within the hospitality industry at the, at the moment. They are now sort of calling out almost for the last time for help in that, you know, there are businesses collapsing all uh, all around us, viable businesses that with just a bit of support to tide them over could get through the other, the other side of this. So that's what I'm talking about, uh, Kevin. Local furlough, proper business uh, support, recognising the losses that those businesses have made. Um, if you're going to close businesses in any area subject to restrictions, it just seems to me to be uh, a, a completely um, essential principle of that system that you compensate those those businesses and those people. And currently that isn't in place and it's wrong that it's not in place. Thanks. Steve, did you want to come in? Yeah, just on the local furlough and, and the fact that we, we did call for that but also we did say that there needed to be a package of support for those people who are being told to to self-isolate if they've been um, contacted by test and trace and they're told um, they have to take a fortnight off work for some people that's really really difficult it's the choice for them between you know putting bread on the table or or potentially going uh, back to work and, and with a um, a virus and, and spreading that and we did ask for um, something that's slightly uh, more beneficial uh, to those people than the government's announcement which you know um, may well help some groups but certainly is not enough and if we want people to carry out their civic duties as we've said is really important then those people should be appropriately compensated as well 
Thanks. Um, question uh, from Katie at That's Manchester for Andy. There have been calls to cancel the 10 pm curfew after people have continued drinking and socialising outside after venues have been shut. There seems to be a lot of blame on government policy, but we are constantly told we're all in this together. Isn't there a level of personal responsibility that people need to take here? Uh, yes, um, th there is. Um, there's um, a lot of personal responsibility that people need to take, and many people are taking that, uh, Katie. Um, but clearly some are not, as Steve said before, and um, we need to continue to require them, ask them, encourage them to, uh, to, to do that. But at the same time, we need kind of policies that, that kind of make sense, that um, are, are not contradictory. And I think what, what we saw with the introduction of the curfew last weekend was I kind of just a feeling that it wasn't thought through. Um, you know, the rush of people out of pubs into supermarkets, uh, really challenging scenes on the streets that the police are just simply not equipped to deal with, given the cuts to police numbers uh, over over the years. And if we had been consulted, we would we would have said this uh, to them. And I think the trouble is when the when the government brings in things that don't really have that public support then people disengage uh, and that is a problem. And I think we're at this point now where people are disengaging because they're either confused or they don't agree with the rules. If if it's homes where the virus is being transmitted, let's focus on that issue and deal with that issue um, and go after these local restrictions, simplify them, clarify them, make it about that issue. What I think this is doing, the curfew is, is going after a different issue but actually then adding to the issue, the problem of transmission in the homes, because I, I put it to you, uh, Katie, I'm pretty certain when I say there were more gatherings on, in the home on Friday, Saturday and Sunday night in Greater Manchester and across the country than there were uh, in weeks gone by. There were more kind of house gatherings, house parties, because that is going to be the effect of this 10 p.m. curfew. So I repeat what I said on Monday, there should be an urgent review of the curfew using the information and the intelligence coming from police forces uh, across the country. I don't think it is stopping the spread of the virus. I do know it's causing major harm to our hospitality industries that are already teetering on a, on a cliff edge. And I think in those circumstances, uh, while you know, the government is kind of justified in looking to find urgent solutions, I think they also have to recognise if something isn't working, you know, don't keep digging in that hole, you know, I, I recognize it and uh, try a different tack. And I, I just feel with this this curfew, um, it, it is it is the wrong policy um, and it's having a counterproductive effect. Thanks. Steve, do you want to come in or are you happy to move on? Just to, to, to add to the, um, the sort of the inter-household mingling, which is, you know, an issue for us. And there's guidance to say that that shouldn't happen. And what we then do is arbitrarily pick a point, 10 o'clock, could have been anything. Um, I'm not sure there's any scientific evidence behind 10 o'clock, but we pick a point and then say, OK, everybody's got to leave now. And, and of course, what people do is then go and get some beer and go and sit somewhere. And we're actually there for, um, seeing the opposite effect to what we wanted where we are getting into household mingling because that's what people will do and they, they'll invite people back and all that sort of stuff and actually the pubs are, are more regulated certainly the, the responsible ones than outside of the pubs you know where they, they they are socially distancing and they do regularly wash things down and they um do you know uh, en encourage people to wash their hands and uh, and act responsibly so I'd say that's counterproductive, but it, this again is another one of those issues that this is not now hindsight that we're saying this in. We said beforehand that if the government really wanted this to work, then possibly one of the ways in which you could stagger the, um, the uh, influx of people onto the street when 10 o'clock hits home was to say that Restaurants, for instance, if they have pre-booked appointments, they could stay open later, which means that people then are not all congregating on the streets. It also means that our public transport system is easier to, to manage. And it means that if people want to get a taxi, for instance, that there'd be capacity for them to leave city centres and town centres. So 
it, it's something that the government, if they just speak to people, um, perhaps they won't come up with the same um, blunt tool and we can tailor it to individual areas. And that's where the consultation that we both spoke about earlier is really important. Thanks very much. We just had a few extra questions come in, so I'm just conscious of time. So I'll just take, um, I'll try and take them in groups. Uh, but one question from Jennifer Williams at the MEN for Andy. Uh, Merseyside leaders, uh, including Joe Anderson, have called for a two week circuit break to arrest rising infection rates there. Do you support such a move here? And if not, what exact measures would you want to see applied in GM going forward in an ideal world with financial support? You say you want consistency. So what consistent rules are you calling for and across what footprint? Thanks, Jen. So I, I'm not fully uh, on top of what Joe has said. I, I'm not sure whether he's called for a national circuit break or a local circuit break. If it's a local, uh, I think that would be a very problematic uh, policy. Um, and I wouldn't want to call for that uh, in Greater Manchester. I can see the case for it at a national level. Um, I don't think we're, we're there yet. Um, but it's obviously something that the government has got under consideration. Um, so what I would say is I wouldn't personally, and I think I'm echoing the, the views of our leaders here in saying we wouldn't want uh, to see any um, particular strengthening of what we've got at the moment, um, but we would like it to be more consistent within Greater Manchester. So, you know, we're not, we're not going to work against the government system of tiers. Um, but I think what we would want it to bring about is a more consistent position again across the city region, certainly correcting the, the Bolton situation. Um, and uh, I also would say bringing uh, Oldham into line with the rest, the rest of, of GM. So uh, I think that's what we need. I, I think there is a, a, a kind of still a, a feeling that local restrictions only achieve so much. And, and actually, it's it's going to be anything national that will really kind of move the cases properly back down again. Um, so consistency across the city region, yes, um, and potentially then across more broadly across the, the northwest. But I, I don't believe there's any appetite in Greater Manchester for significant strengthening of the of the regulations that we've we've got. I think what we want them to be is is clearer, simpler. Uh, we want them to come with more financial support, as I've been saying today. Um, but if there's to be any circuit break of any kind, I would say that has to be considered as a national policy, not as a local policy. And just to follow up to that, Hannah Miller um, at Granada has asked Andy, um, GM has had advice against household mixing for weeks. Should that be turned into a ban like in the North East? What difference, if any, would that make in your opinion? And Jim McMahon, the Oldham MP, has called for people to be allowed to meet socially distanced outdoors in Oldham. Do you agree with that? So um, I think um, the answer to, to the first part of Hannah's question is, you know, that that would be one thing that I think we would obviously discuss with the government if they wanted to move in that direction and standardise the regulations in Greater Manchester with those in the Liverpool City region and those in the North East. I wouldn't say we would necessarily straight away agree with that, but I think there's a, there's a logic to, to clarify, simplify, strengthen what is already in place. And as effectively, that is what is already in place. It's partly advice at the moment, when it comes to being outside of the household. Um, but, you know, th there is an argument um, for for uh, strengthening that, Al although I would only say hello at this, Hannah, at this stage, it's an argument for it and it would have to be agreed by uh, by the 10 leaders uh, in Greater Manchester because there isn't huge appetite uh, for loading more and more on what people would already say are uh, fairly ineffective um, uh, regulations. Uh, in terms of um, people being allowed to meet socially distanced uh, outdoors in Oldham. Absolutely, I would agree that Oldham should be standardised with the rest of Greater Manchester, as should Bolton, uh, in in my uh, view. We always had a concern about gardens being included. Uh, I just still think this is one of those areas where the public lose sort of confidence in the regulations because they, it says, well, you can't meet in a garden, but you can meet in a park. And I think that's one of the areas where, you know, the, the regulations have lost public um, uh, sort of buy-in, basically, because they seem inconsistent and, and inexplicable. So, you know, I, I think there's a case for 
making the regulations more consistent across GM and potentially across the northwest and the northeast, uh, possibly strengthening in the way that you say, although I, I caveat that by saying, you know, that, that's a, a debate to be had. Um, but, um, you know, I think at the same time, we should look at giving more flexibility to people in those outdoor in those outdoor spaces. Uh, focus on the problem, which is transmission in the home. And I think then, you know, cr create a situation that most people then will find easier to understand and observe. Thanks, Andy. There's two quick questions on Bolton and then there's two quick questions at the end uh, for yourself and Steve. So we'll, we'll deal with the Bolton ones first and then we'll finish on the, the, the final ones from Radio Manchester. Uh, Paige at uh, the EMEAN asks, do you think the takeout only rule should be relaxed in Bolton and why are Bolton's pubs closed when rates are lower uh, than elsewhere? And should everywhere else be like Bolton or should Bolton be more like everywhere else? Well, I, I would probably say, uh, Paige, that Bolton now should, should come into line everywhere else and, and the pubs should be allowed to open. My observation, and I do like to go to pubs, as, as most people might, might know, is that they've got better and better over the, the summer at the procedures that they're implementing uh, to, to keep people safe. Um, I, I, I observe that, and, and I know it's not every pub, but the majority seem to me to be taking things very seriously. They are managing the internal environment of the pub or the restaurant well. Uh, they've invested a lot of money in doing that. And those environments, as Steve was saying earlier, are clearly better, a more regulated environment than forcing people out of those places into gatherings on the street, in supermarkets or in the home, which is the effect of the, of the, um, the national uh, curfew. So on Bolton particularly, I would say, absolutely. How can you justify shutting pubs and restaurants in a place where other places very close by have much higher higher numbers of cases. I don't think that you can uh, justify that. So there are two options, aren't there? You know, close the same places everywhere above a certain level of cases uh, with compensation or let Bolton's open. And I would probably say let Bolton's uh, open. What I would finally just add though, if I may, is the leaders of Greater Manchester are really clear that what we actually want is uh, much tougher summary closure powers with respect to pubs or restaurants that, that are posing a, a problem with regard to, to um, spread of the virus. So rather than just blanket restrictions that shut everywhere, a much uh, swifter ability to go in and close a place that we know is, 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 um, is not following the rules uh, properly. And we've made that pitch to the government. I understand they're reviewing uh, this issue at the moment, but I think that would send the right message around the hospitality industry. Yes, you can you can open, you must follow the rules. And if you don't, the authorities can close it, you, your place down extremely quickly. I think that would be the, the right way to go rather than having uh, you know these blanket bans. But in the case of Bolton, it is completely indefensible what is happening there right now. Thanks, Andy. The final question, uh, and we'll go to Steve first uh, on this one. Uh, so these two questions, and then Steve, if you've got any, any final things you want to say, and then Andy, these two questions, any final things you want to say. So it's the it's the last two questions. Uh, the list is anonymous, but they're from uh, Sarah at Radio Manchester. Some people have asked why shielding has not been brought back in in areas with tighter restrictions. Is that something you've asked government to advise to help people of working age being expected to go in? And uh, specifically, Steve, a lot of focus is on Liverpool city region. Areas like St Helens and Knowsley look to be disproportionately worse. Um, well, the first bit about shielding, it, that's something, again, that we're talking to government about. And I, I do believe that there's a, an important part of what those restrictions might lead to that we need to address. And that is our local authorities who have been hollowed out, really. Um, they're the first port of call when government wants some help, some assistance. They go to our local authorities and say, for instance, we've got a problem with shielding. Can you sort this out for us? Uh, and, and you can't play both sides of that coin. If governments want to work with local authorities, because local authorities do want to work with central government, then they need to do this at a, a sort of a, a more mature level and not just um, implementing things and promising things that never ever materialise. Do you remember? Rishi Shunak's whatever it takes and then councils went away and did 
whatever it took. And unfortunately, they weren't recompensed for what they'd done on behalf of us all. So I think shielding comes into that. We do need to protect the most vulnerable in our community. And I would definitely be supportive of our councils being supported by government to, to do that. Um, the second part is a bit strange, it's something about uh, Liverpool and um, city region and then St Helens. Well, St Helens is part of the Liverpool city region. Knowsley is part of the Liverpool city region. It It's like Manchester, Greater Manchester. Manchester's part of that, but so are nine other districts. Um, we, I don't talk about Liverpool. I talk about Liverpool city region. Uh, and whoever posed the question is right. The figures in Nosley, for instance, are, are really concerning. And if you have a look at, I know they're lower, but if you have a look at the rate of transmission in the likes of Halton, um, that's of real concern as well. What we need to do is to have a, a, a solution working again with government that all six local leaders feel comfortable to buy into. And then we need to quite clearly articulate the same message across the whole patch in that way hopefully we won't see some of the mistakes that have happened in the past repeated because it's really really important that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet and i think there's a, a statement by matt hancock at 3 30 today um i hope he's not just going to announce stuff that hasn't been discussed by the leadership in the liverpool city region and impose things from a central government diktat that that won't be acceptable and it probably won't work the only way we can truly ensure that those things work is by us all agreeing the same direction and the same policy and the same restrictions if that's necessary but with that financial support that's so important to councils and our business ecosystem thanks steve Just bring in andy on that one uh, and any other final points was it on the shielding one, Ross? Do you want me to answer? Or? Yeah, on the on the shielding one. Yeah. So I think this is a real um, a, a real concern um, from two ways. Actually, there are some people who think the shielding policy, in some ways, cuts people off from the rest of society. And I think Simon Stevens has spoken about that. But while that is a valid concern, we mustn't uh, lose sight of the fact that there are some people who had been shielding who are now back at the work. Who are feeling increasingly um, uncomfortable given the rising number of, of cases. So I think rather than going back um, to a shielding uh, policy of the kind we had earlier this year, I think the right thing to do would be to allow people who feel they want to shield to do so and create a local shielding scheme uh, in, in uh, cooperation with local councils and certainly we're developing at the moment a, um, a Greater Manchester uh, shielding policy that might you know, allow a bit of uh, flexibility for people, but also be, be a sort of reduced uh, reduced in scope, basically, from what we had uh, earlier uh, early this year. But it's certainly an area that I think is becoming increasingly important uh, and mustn't be mustn't be neglected. Alongside another issue, which is visits to care homes, I think that's becoming an increasing challenge uh, for for uh, many people who've not seen. Um, you know, uh, husbands, wives, parents with dementia over many, many, many months now and are getting very, very worried uh, about the, um, the, the, the condition of, 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 their, uh, of their loved ones. Um, and I think given the numbers of uh, cases in care homes, we mustn't allow an over um, protectiveness, if you like, to stop, cut off that basic human contact, which is going to be uh, pretty crucial. So I think on that issue of care home visits and on the issue of shielding, we need to kind of come back with a sort of a, a workable, um, a workable policy that is not not uh, like what we had before, but is something that will 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 work for people going through the next few months. So Ross, I'll just if I just finish by um, just just thanking people for for tuning in. I don't know if Steve wants to to make a, a final thought. You know, I, I do come back to what I said. I, I mean, in our lifetimes, at least, not in terms of you know what this country's seen in the past but certainly in our lifetimes as people of our generation i think we are staring at the most uh challenging winter we've ever uh, been through because you know we've had the health crisis and that continues 
But I think now we're, we're going to see the economic crisis break with the with the health crisis simultaneously because the redundancies are going to start, as I said before, if things stay as they are. And I think what you're hearing from Steve and I today is it's, it's a plea, really. It's, it's, it's not said in any spirit of uh, point scoring. We are a bit frustrated. We just want solutions and we want to kind of work better with the government, not for any reasons of, of, of politics, simply to protect our residents, to protect our communities uh, from what we can see is coming right at us uh, now. And we think it would be in everyone's interest to, to, to develop uh, a, a better way of working. It would rebuild some national unity, which is which is needed uh, right now. I think we're all finding that it's harder to live with this virus than perhaps we thought it was uh, going to be. We're not in a state of readiness yet uh, to face the difficult months that lie ahead. We're both saying we are ready. We keep repeating that call. Please involve us. Please consult us. Work with us. Empower us so we can empower our councils and our communities to face this. You know, it's a call we repeat uh, today, uh, but I think it's a call we can't carry on making without it becoming too late because I think we are pretty much at the point now where uh, unless we see change within a matter of a week or two, um, we won't be able to to alter what's what's ahead of us uh, as we approach the winter. So thank you everybody for uh, for listening to us uh, today uh, and maybe hand over to Steve for any final words. No, just in the exact same spirit as yourself, um, Andy, and, and that is that we sort of left the party political point score in, in Westminster uh, and we've always tried wherever possible to look for consensus and try to work with government uh, collaboratively. This is one occasion where genuinely um, this is way, way above uh, trying to have a pop at Boris Johnson or a Tory government or whatever. It's far too important to us because if we don't get this right, then what we saw in wave one, which was the transmission rate go up, then hospitalisation and of course deaths, we're going to see again. And, and nobody, nobody wants to go through what we went through a few months ago. And we need to ensure that wherever possible, we're doing everything that we can collectively to save people's lives. And that is the overriding issue in all of this. Thanks everyone and we will see you uh, next week for the uh, next press briefing. Thank you.